members who may wish to speak. So we've got a few councillors. Speaker, Councillor Noakes. Thank you, Lord. The first time I spoke in this uh, chamber, um, I actually talked about fuel poverty and uh, about tax people. Um, and as soon as this is my last time to speak in this chamber, uh, it feels uh, rather fitting. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that. <laughs> It feels rather fitting that we should be talking about climate change, something that's been quite close to my, my, uh, my professional life and my time on council as well. Um, I, I used to be the North West Chair of the Transport Climate Change Committee, um, and so uh, I've been quite involved in a lot of the things that have gone on around the North West uh, on this. Um, I'm not going to go through all the things that we've done in terms of transport and uh, quality. You can look at the document, which I actually think is a really good document. If you get a chance to look at sections D3 and D7, to look at transport and air quality. I'm also really pleased that we've recognised that some things that we do to tackle climate change are not actually compatible with how we tackle air quality and vice versa. And um, one of those things, for instance, is electric vehicles. As we move towards more electric vehicles, we know we'll see high demands for materials such as cobalt uh, and the disastrous. Um, industry that that is in places like the Congo where we see 40,000 kids working down mines uh, in order so you can have your smartphones and you can have your electric cars. Um, which brings me on to something else um, which I will talk about in this uh, section and that is that the poor don't use much fossil fuels. They, uh, they don't really have access, they don't have cars, the poor don't have cars, the poor try and keep their homes as best as they can and they don't use fossil fuels. If you've got anywhere in life, certainly in the developed world, you've got there because you've been able to use fossil fuels, we have to be very careful when we start lecturing people out there about their fuel use uh, amongst all of this uh, debate um, because the poor are the ones who are both suffering and not got access and if we just pull the ladder up uh, behind us then that does no one any favours. Um, I would like to finally talk about something which is not mentioned in any of the papers but we really need to get real about and that's climate change adaptation. We can talk all we want about how we're going to reduce carbon emissions and the actions that we wish to take. Unless we get real about accepting that we need to adapt already then we'll be failing in our duty. Many years ago I worked on a project that ended up being the, uh, the website Climate Just which looked at uh, vulnerability and that looked at uh, different ways of considering vulnerability. That is, the ability to prepare, the ability to respond, the ability to recover. And that doesn't necessarily follow that just because you're poor, you're vulnerable. If you have got a three-car family and you've got no access to public transport because you've never actually used it, if there's an incident in your area, you're incredibly vulnerable. So we need to get the message out there to those people who may feel like they're quite protected from all of this, that climate change is going to affect them as well. Um, so, uh, as I leave this chamber at some point, I personally like to thank everyone who's helped me along the way. It would take far too long to go through that. I'd like to thank my warm colleagues, specifically Ross and, uh, and Irene, for all the help that they've been over the years. And I would wish everybody in this chamber well in taking on something as big as climate change but also the many other problems that we're going to have to deal with along the way and find the balance to do that. Thank you.
expert on this issue and genuinely be a great, great loss, not just, not just for this council, but for this city. So all the very best for the future, mate, and really welcome for the players in the trade on this agenda. Um, I want to say a few things about not just what we're doing on transport, but actually what more we need to do. Because I go around this country and I'm very proud to say that I think we've got one of the best transport networks in this country outside of London. But because frankly we have to deal with the legacy of deregulation and privatisation by international standards is bad. And let's acknowledge that because there's so much best practice that's happening in other parts of the world. We really, really have to catch up. So let's not bleat about the problems with that. Let's move away from those restrictive models and do things differently. Um, for me, there's lots of different things we've got to do. First and foremost, we've got to make public transport the first choice. There's great stuff we're doing, like brand new publicly owned trains on the Mersey Ground Network that will attract loads of new passengers onto the network starting from next year. But that's only any good if you are on the rail network. We genuinely need to be thinking about how we extend that network. So we do need to be looking at the ways we extend the network into East Liverpool, like Harry talks about, North Liverpool, like Ian talks about, and making sure everyone gets those connections. And that's not wistful thinking. We just reopened a link to North Wales we've not had for 40 years. We do have the credibility and the back of the track record to do that. Loads of things we've got to do with buses. We should be proud about the fact that 70% of the fleet locally is low emission. But that ain't good enough. We really need to move to zero emissions. And when lots of people say to me, why aren't we doing exactly what we're doing in Manchester? Let me be very, very clear. The legislation that devolves with new powers, the powers I'm dead excited about, is really, really complicated. And I think deliberately so, because the Tory government don't want us to use it. Let me assure you, in the coming months, we will be bringing back some really visionary proposals about how we can take our bus network forward. And a key part of that needs to be about how we make public transport more affordable. Frankly, it's too expensive. Far too many can't afford to use it, and those people who can are chased away because it's not seen as good value. We really need to address that. And again, we've got a great track record, because when we cut fares for kids on buses, what do we do? We double the number of kids using the bus network. It's an economic no-brainer. We just need to crack on and do these kind of things. Cycling, again, this is something that we need to do a lot more of. It's fantastic when we look at some of the recent announcements about how we're actually going to be rolling out more segregated cycle lanes. 55 kilometres across our region. Talking the paper about being able to ride from street to the city centre. But you know what? That's going to continue all the way up to Southport. Real great start on how we can extend our cycle network. But you know what? We've got to emulate Seville on this. They have a fantastic plan to put in place a side two highway network over a decade. Because they have the vision, they did it in two. So we need to become a scouse side in Seville to make sure we give people safe options to ride their bikes. One of the things we've really got to focus on is the movement of goods and freight. It really troubles me when we look at the number of vans and trucks running around the road network in our city. If we were to open up the back of all those vans and trucks, you would find that most of those are actually mainly empty. We've really got to consolidate all of that. And I'll finish the points on two elements. One of the things I request is we've got to make sure that we're bold on this. Some of this stuff will be really difficult. We've really got to be really, really brave, and we've got to lead by this. Councillor Tommy, can I advise Councillor that this is Councillor Tommy's uh, first speech, so can we um, all pay attention? Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, okay, so basically, thank you all there, Pat. Um, just my speech is regarding the fact that we are building in the top 10 air pollution in the UK, the UK uh, cities and towns. Basically, air pollution is affecting the health of people in Liverpool, it affects the youngest, the oldest, and the poorest the most. It's linked to premature births and stunted, lung growth in children, as real danger to those with a heart or lung condition. In the Liverpool city region, there's a record of 225,400 people have a cardiovascular heart disease, and around 42,800 people have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Fine air particle air pollution is 
particularly bad for us, penetrates deep into your lungs and the cardiovascular systems, causing diseases including strokes, heart disease, lung cancer, and respiratory infections. The World Health Organization reports that Liverpool is in the top 10, as I mentioned before, and the figure exceeds the limit of 10 micrograms per cubic meter. Liverpool's rating at the moment is currently 12 cubic meter, uh, micrograms per cubic meter of uh, nitrogen dioxide and other chemicals in the air. London is only 11, so a higher than that. This now brings me on to another issue with regards to this. Liverpool Council has closed down all the AURN networks which monitor the city, uh, city centre at Queen's Drive, leaving one in a field in a primary school in a quite residential part of speak. So is that 12 meters in totally wrong? So basically there's nothing in the city is regarded as that's correct. The station is closed, follow on to another issue. The Haymarket one has been closed, which also is no longer where the bus hub is going to be, which I also feel potentially will have a risk of causing more harm to the, to the environment than good. Um, it's also closed <coughs> in the Liverpool Centre and one on Queen's Drive. What I'd like us all to do here is to <coughs> monitor the air pollution levels first outside each local school in the area, reopen the closed monitoring stations. And Mayor Anderson mentioned earlier about the Clean Air Act, it was actually repealed in 1993. So I'd like to push again for that act to, to be put into place. And, uh, thanks for your time. Thank you.
just uh, a couple of things for you. Okay, okay. the, the R uh, sites that you, you're talking about, councillor, where we can find the city council, by the way. So there were, you know, there's different ways of measuring their quality. They were removed by us, so let's make that absolutely clear. I don't know you were unfair that it was us, but simply it, it, it wasn't us. Um, well, look, the, the, there's a, a number of things that uh, have been uh, talked about. And, you know, Liam uh, talked about, for instance, um, the situation that we face with the current legislation in regards to our transport and deregulation. We are basically stupid unless we get the powers that have been promised to us to actually take back into public ownership the whole transport network, and I mean the whole transport network. We have the obscenity of cities like Liverpool paying £38 million pound a year to subsidise pensioners' travel, and yet Dutch Bar make billions of pounds worth of profits across the whole of Europe and the whole of its network. Absolutely obscene, and we need it changing. And that's why we need to bring transport back into public ownership so that we can actually uh, deal with that particular issue. But also, let's not uh, dismiss the things that we can do equally. We failed as a city region for squabbling when we didn't actually set up a, a, a transport, light rail, network, tram 15, 16 years ago. We should have grasped it and we could have built on it and we could have done, done something with it. And it was the political infighting of city, region, local authorities arguing against each other that stopped us. And now we have a city region with the ability to borrow lots of money to start making a huge difference, investing in those industries that are going to actually make a real difference in this area. That's the type of thinking that we've got to do. And Tom, coming back to your contribution before, I accept the, the little jabs about what we can and what we can't do. But now that we have got climate change recognised by government, in all of these areas that we're now talking about, we can force change. And we're happy to lead the way, and we're happy to invest in what we can to do things. What we've got to do is make sure that we know exactly what it is we need to do and what we're talking about. And I'm sure we can do that in the discussions and in the debates that we have, which Laura Collins will monitor as the Climate Select Committee looks at those four themed areas moving forward. Thank you very much. Councillor Keys. Thank you. 
this incentivize car travel into the city center. In this chamber, we can leave, by example, immediately and agree to scrap a privilege that all councillors are entitled to, namely free car parking in the city center. A big elephant in the room, not even mentioned in the briefing notes for this meeting, is the cruise industry. Whilst we are all very proud of how attractive Liverpool is to overseas visitors, we have to agree that cruise ships are a major pollutant and we cannot be serious about tackling climate emergency without dealing with this issue. The same goes for the expansion of Liverpool Airport. I sincerely hope that the soon to be formed Climate Change Committee will give these issues very serious consideration. When we all agree tonight that we are facing climate emergency, let's ensure all our policies put the environment first and that this meeting does not become another talking shop, but a start of doing things differently. We don't have much time left, but we can do it if we put all our efforts into it. Thank you, Councillor Liz Hayden. and I think we need to realise that and it affects working class people more than it, it affects anyone else. In this city we are already seeing the worst air pollution in the poorest areas and across the world in the global south they are already seeing the mass effects of climate change so I think we need to put it in that perspective. It's a catastrophe that has been caused by the capitalist system that we currently live under with the six biggest corporations are the largest polluters on the planet. So we can't do it as individuals. We need to curtail these, these uh, corporations and stop what they are doing to humanity and, and animals across the globe. We need to have structural change in order to avoid this catastrophe. We need socialism. Green houses built by our council for the people in this city. Local community cooperatives growing food locally, publicly owned green energy companies providing electricity for Liverpool, free transport or provided by national transport across the country. So we're, do we're doing an amazing thing today, but we can't do it alone. So we need to think about it in the larger, um, the larger context. So I applaud what we're doing today. But we can't do it unless we see a real change across this country and across the world. Thanks. Just a quick one. Councillor Bradford's left the chamber now, but it was just a point to sort out this connection. But um, spoken about before by William, the link line over. Passing the town's port of the trains. Link said about the hot square link in Liverpool with Wales. And the reason that we spoke about it when Liverpool were originally moving at the ground and we couldn't put in the rails, not because the Brutal Square was closed, but because the whole link, the loop was closed. And that uh, necessitated large goods trains coming out of Liverpool docks having to go to um, Edge Hill and go up and then come back down into the city to turn around and go out onto the line because the whole loop was closed. And while they were doing that, that cut down on the number of trains that could actually go the other way down to the Brutal Line. And that's why that line never went. And we started working on it then and now the loop line, the, the loop line the whole loop has been opened. That's why there's now consideration for being able to put passenger trains back onto that line because that was one of the things then was to link that south end of the city to the north end of the city to create passenger trains, the time on the line to create passenger trains so the unemployed centres up to where the job was going to be created and that's the goal ahead. It was not, nothing to do with the line being closed. It was to do with not having the facilities 
to be able to go the lines through because the freight trains coming in and out of the C4 did not have passenger trains to run on them. And it's a pity that Steve's not out now because he might have been there, but I was the ward councillor on with the old ward councillor at the time and knew what was going on. Council Pam Thomas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Change has to happen, we all, we all know this, and it's not going to be easy. We don't have all the answers, but this is not a reason not to act, nor is it a reason to carry on in the same way. The systems, practices and behaviours have developed without consideration of the impact on the planet. Change will really inconvenience many, and it could also cause real problems for some people. And we won't know what all of those problems are as yet. Disabled people are more reliant on cars than non-disabled people. When I was on the Transport Committee, um, I had great support from Councillor Robinson and colleagues to ensure that the new trains will be fully accessible for disabled people and the trains at the stations will be as well. This means that more disabled people can use them and hopefully not need to use cars. The change to electric, electric cars will be great, but the design of cars does not take account of disabled people either. Uh, they won't take a wheelchair, for example. I'd love to have one. If you find me an electric car and take a wheelchair, please let me know. Disabled people are overlooked in design time and time again. Many of the buses now are wheelchair accessible in theory, but there's only one space. If that space is taken by someone with a child in a buggy, we have to often get into an argument to free up that space. But also, I don't want to be the person who pushes somebody with a little child or maybe twins in a buggy off the bus so I can get on. Um, I've stayed in the bus stop because I didn't want to do that on one occasion. Um, and also then there's the issue of getting to the, the bus stops or the train stations. So that has impacts then on the built environment to make sure that the um, the route is accessible to the stops. Disabled people have been campaigning for accessible transport for over 30 years and this is a, a shows how long it's taken us to get to this point. If it's climate change that gets us there, that's great. Disabled people want, uh, want to, um, to stop the, what's happening as much as anybody else, but we also need your help to make sure that we can take part in that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yeah, we, we, we have gone over a uh, lot of time, so I'm only going to allow one more speaker, and then uh, you, you will get the chance in the next three themed debates to, to speak if you don't get any chance in this one. So the next person is Councillor Steve Mulby. Um, I think we can all agree on the motion, but I'm concerned that it doesn't contribute to climate change by becoming more hot air. Um, that's why I welcome the appointment of Councillor Robinson Collins as uh, the cabinet member for tackling climate change because I think the primary job is to go to make all our lives extremely difficult. Um, and I know she'll do that very well. So I think that was a very great appointment. So, um, look, I think there's two things we have to do in parallel. One is we have to challenge some fundamental assumptions which we all operate by. The other is to come up with practical solutions. And I'll give you three areas. The first is about transport. I think that in the next 20 years, the motor car will be finished. It should be finished, I think it will be. I think we should have to use our imagination. And we have to move very quickly in terms of policies. There's no part of our job to help motor cars move through the city quickly. We have to get absolute priorities to the bus. As soon as possible, get the motor cars to the city centre. Certainly get rid of all diesel and other vehicles from the city centre. That change is going to happen much quicker than we think. We're going to have to argue that, but we're going to have to come up with practical solutions. Buses, again, they've been a bit of a right off the joke that highways, highways cares about cars and motor travel cares about trains and buses getting left out. But we have to come up with practical solutions. I'm very pleased to sit down with uh, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Robinson and colleagues earlier today to look at some solutions to some of the challenges around bus travel. In the, in the city, in the south of the city, I think we came up with some ideas that can help address that. Second issue, tourism, I think, which is saturation point. I think we have to start thinking that we actually should be so much about having tourists come to the city, because actually tourism is a massive contributor to climate change. Um, but we have to have practical solutions that range from tackling in the detail the problems that Airbnb are generating in the city. 
in terms of cruise lines, there are things that we could do to mitigate fuel emissions. You could do with short um, supplies, tackling food waste, and I think that's going to be part of your job, Councillor Robertson, because I wish you luck with it. The third issue is about the way we think about economic policy and economic growth, because I think we're, we're pretty crazy in the way we think about it. We have completely false measuring systems. I'll give you a little example that's put to me. A storm and steep where people who travel to work there travel miles. And Leo's in Park Road, where three quarters of the people, not Leo's Tesco, shows how our Tesco's in Park Road, where three quarters of the labour are local. Any conventional measure of economic performance will say that the storm and steep has twice the output of the storm in Tesco's, which is crazy. The people who work at Speedway are traveling far longer to work, having to pay bus fares. But it's because they're traveling on, the driving there, that's apparently an economic indicator. That's a mad way to measure things. So we have to think about, really it's about using the Preston model to bring back the local procurement, to reduce how much of the travel. That's both as... Um, Councilor Mulvey, can we start? I'm just to wind up, yeah. Close the down. And the mm -hmm. it is a class issue. One way to do that is by actual open procurement. So there's a lot of challenges that we've got ahead, but we've got to change the way we think and challenge a lot of our shippers. That's not going to be easy, we get a lot worse than that. So the next one we have, the next debate is buildings and the built environment, and we have a short video again.